Uh, let me just begin by saying how delighted I am to be here tonight. This is uh, the first time out of my cave to give a, uh, a public lecture in uh, a year and a half. Um, I'm also delighted uh, because it was a wonderful idea of the Goethe Institute and the Thomas Mann House to organize this exhibition, especially in the United States right now. Mann has fallen from public view in the United States, and today it's rare to find an undergraduate who has spent any time in the company of Tonio Krüger, Tony Budenbrook, Hans Kastorp, or Adrian Leverkuhn. Mann's major novels were once a necessary rite of passage for young Americans serious about literature or simply serious about themselves and their lives. It's a pity that we have not been able to transmit our love of his work to our children. About Mann's extraordinary political laufbahn, young Americans know even less. And what a story it is. From the time of Mann's first political interventions in 1914 to his departure from McCarthy Mad America in 1952, Mann made all of the 20th century Stations of the Cross. He began as a cultural nationalist during the First World War, then became a vocal defender of the Weimar Republic afterward. He went into permanent exile in 1933, only managing to escape the Nazis because he was on a speaking tour abroad when they came for him. He and his wife Katya finally made their way to the United States in 1938 and became American citizens during the Second World War. Thomas Mann met with President Roosevelt joined the war effort, and defended the Allies' cause in those broadcasts that were beamed into Germany. He also became a, an important public speaker here in the United States, giving stirring speeches about democratic values across the country. Tens of thousands of Americans turned out to hear him. 10,000 Americans at Madison Square Garden the year he arrived uh, in 1938 to stay here permanently. And those speeches are still worth reading today. As a sentence on the website of the exhibition puts it, Mann's resistance is inspiring and relevant today as we witness the fundamental values of democracy once again being called into question. And yes, it is inspiring. Yet we must also bear in mind that Thomas Mann is not our contemporary. And we do him an injustice if we just see him as a moral precursor of ourselves. He never saw himself as a political activist, as we use the term today anyway. Indeed, I'm sure he would have had serious reservations about what passes for democratic discourse and political activism today. Neither was his embrace of democracy inspired by some moral commitment to achieving human equality. Mann's fundamental, unwavering concern throughout his life was with art and with the autonomy of the artist in society, not morality and not politics. He never abandoned his belief that artists can be, if they wish to be, a breed apart with a higher calling than that of the ordinary citizen. In the last decades of his life, Mann finally came to see that one can and ought to be both a serious artist and a serious Democrat. But he never lost the sense that a tension always exists between political convictions and passions on the one hand and the demands of art on the other. And it's this aspect of Thomas Mann's thinking that I'd like to dwell on tonight. Prior to the First World War, Thomas Mann was a respected member of the German cultural establishment and had never expressed any political views. <clears throat> he was, as he, as he rightly put it, just a good German burger. All that changed in 1914. Why it changed is anyone's guess. From one month to the next, he became an intransigent defender of the German cause on the international stage. 
He wrote inflammatory articles and gave speeches that made him a favorite on the folkish nationalist right. As the war dragged on, he put aside his literary projects to devote himself entirely to a defense of Germany against the onslaught of so-called alien Western ideas of enlightenment and democracy. This is how his strangest work, The Reflections of a Non-Political Man, came into being. It was published in 1918, just as the war was ending with Germany's defeat. Despite its significance in Mann's life, Reflections is the least read and certainly least loved of his works. And it's not hard to see why. Most readers today will find the reactionary political views he expressed in it repellent, as Mann himself eventually did. What tends to get lost to view, though, is any sense of what Mann wanted to defend in the book. Yes, at the time, he opposed revolution, democracy, liberalism, internationalism, the French Enlightenment, and British unregulated capitalism. Yes, he defended Germany's cause in the war. But in the name of what? Just who is this non-political man that he thought needed defending? And against whom? The last question is the easiest to answer. It was against his brother, Heinrich Mann, that the reflections was directly, uh, most directly aimed. Heinrich was four years older than Thomas and temperamentally quite different. He left home early to become a writer and became popular for his biting left-wing satires of Wilhelmine society and politics. Thomas was more old-fashioned, more conservative by temperament, and felt no attraction to bohemianism uh, or revolutionary politics. The artists, he felt, should be in the world but not of the world. He was disappointed and then angered by what he saw as Heinrich's abandonment of a higher calling. Even more, Thomas felt Heinrich and writers like him were distorting the nature of art by making it subservient to their political commitments. To become committed is to abandon one's post as an artist. Yet in August 1914, Thomas himself briefly abandoned his post as an artist. His enthusiastic public response to the war, though hard to comprehend now, was perfectly conventional at the time. Heinrich, by contrast, was one of the few German intellectuals to speak out immediately and publicly against it. Not only that, he declared his hope that Germany would be defeated and that a democratic republic would be established in Germany. And it was these differences that caused a break between the brothers, and they did not speak again until 1922. Now, as you may know, much has been written about the Mons sibling rivalry. But at its core was a serious dispute about intellectuals and politics that is still with us today. The position of Heinrich was clear. As he wrote in 1911, before the war, An intellectual who attaches himself to the master caste is committing treason against the mind today. He went even further in a famous essay on Emile Zola, which was directed against Thomas and other defenders of the German cause. There Heinrich wrote, literature and politics have the same object, the same goal, adding Zola's work became more human the more political it became. In some passages, Heinrich even sounds like a Soviet Politburo official extolling socialist realism. This is a quote. The awakening of the masses, exclamation point. Could this be a task, question mark? Yes, even this, exclamation point. Also for this, should the masses awaken? Another exclamation point. It's hard to know what appalled Thomas more about such statements and exclamation points. Was it the messianic pose of the engaged writer 
who sees himself as a spokesman for the people about whom he knows very little? Was it the morally superior being convinced he was speaking truth to power about which he knows even less? Or was it the call to transform art into uplifting propaganda? To judge by reflections of a non-political man, it was all of those things. The most difficult thing to understand about this book is just what Thomas Mann meant by the word politics. We have to read a third of the way into it before we finally get a definition. We're told politics is the opposite of aestheticism. This is surely the most idiosyncratic definition of politics that anyone has ever thought to give the term. But it reveals that the word politics here is really just an umbrella term for all the forces in modern life that Mann saw threatening the artistic calling. This er distinction between aesthetics and politics stands behind countless other oppositions that litter the book and were very much in the air at the time he was writing. Art versus intellect, soul versus society, irony versus moralism, nation versus republic, the ideas of 1914 versus the ideas of 1789, and so on. What I, the non-political man, oppose, Mann seems to be saying, is all that. Well, who then is this intellectual proponent of politics in this anti-aesthetic sense? Mann calls him the civilization literat, which is an un unlovely word even in German. Mann meant the term literat to be derogatory, indicating a self-righteous, dilettantish, dilettantish scribbler who feels himself called upon to be the world's moral tutor. As Thomas Snidely put it, thinking of his brother, this human type believes in justice and progress and democracy and has the high hopes of raising Germany to the level of Paraguay. But above all, the political man believes that art has no end in itself that is merely a tool for reaching humanitarian political ends. The literat is the opposite, indeed the enemy, of the serious artist. He is an evangelical who, Mann writes, would commit intellectual and art to a democratic doctrine of salvation. Thomas's position could not be more opposed to this. He wrote, the exquisite superiority of art over simple intellectuality lies in art's lively ambiguity, its deep lack of commitment, its intellectual freedom. For him at the time, politics and democratic politics in particular was a threat to that freedom. Now, Thomas Mann's disparagement of political democracy ended with the rise of fascism in the 1930s. His essay, Culture and Politics of 1939, is the closest thing he ever wrote to a mea culpa for the political ravings of the reflections. In that essay, he describes how his entire upbringing had turned, trained him rather, to see democracy as a threat to culture and to the inner freedom of the artist. He admitted of the connection between moral freedom and social freedom, I understood little and cared less. The legacy of the non-political German and of the Kulturnation that Mann had once extolled was he now recognized a world historical nightmare. His elegant disdain of democratic revolution, this is Mann, has made him the tool of another revolution, an anarchic one, running amok to threaten the foundations and props of all our Western morality and civilization. A world revolution to which no invasion of the Huns in olden times can even be compared. So to defend his artistic freedom, the artist must at the very least now learn to defend his political freedom. 
But must he go farther? That's the question. Is the artist in a democracy obliged to become a democratic artist? That is, must his or her work be aimed at making ours a more democratic world? Heimlich Mann believed it did. Thomas Mann's answer was a very loud no, even after his conversion to, to democracy, political democracy. While he disowned the political ideas expressed in the reflections, he never disowned the aesthetic ideas. This is what he had to say on the subject just a few years before his death when he was living in Switzerland. The artist is not originally a moral being, but an aesthetic one. Never should I blame an artist who declared that reforming the world's morals was no business of his. The artist improves the world not by moral precepts, but by quite different means, improves upon it by endowing it with spirit and meaning. Now, as we know, this idea is very much out of season today. But behind it lies a quite complex understanding of what art, and in particular literature, actually contributes to life. And that, in Thomas Mann's view, is what he called objectivity. Objectivity is freedom. That phrase serves as something of a mantra in reflections. By it, Mann meant something different from what some people mean by scientific objectivity. Rather than provide a distance, non-perspectival view of reality, artistic objectivity is what keeps us close to the thisness of things with all its perspectives. It implies concreteness, impartiality, actuality. It means, you might say, letting, letting things be what they are, not appropriating them for some narrow purpose and thereby delimiting their connotations and meanings. Flaubert, Dostoevsky, Turgenev were among the 19th century writers Mann most admired. And what impressed him about them was their capacity to see life, as he put it, stereoscopically, from multiple standpoints at once. In their novels, no character is simple, no situation is simple. The moralist soon loses his way in books like this. Reality is filtered through the artist's imagination, but never loses its multidimensionality, its ambiguity. The art of these writers, Mann wrote, was to represent points of view, to deal in dialectics, always letting the one who is speaking at the time be right. And of course, to achieve this requires great sympathy and great restraint. The political artist, then and now, operates differently. He sees life through a monocle because he has an overriding mission to complete. In order to make his point, he must transform three-dimensional reality into a simple two-dimensional sketch that teaches a moral lesson. Such an artist is under the illusion of creating freely when, in fact, he is indentured to an idea. He is a slave. Any aspect of reality that does not serve that idea is forbidden him. Because this political artist's psychological insight is limited, so is his sympathy. Heroes and cowards are very easy to identify. So are friend and enemy. Characters speak in formulas and never, ever surprise us. We always know what the story is about and have no trouble summarizing its lesson. But just ask yourself, how would one summarize the lesson of a sentimental education? Or the idiot? Or fathers and sons? Or for that matter, the magic mountain? It's impossible of how many contemporary novels, American novels at least, can that be said today? 
It's not hard to imagine how Thomas Mann would have judged our present cultural moment. The sons and daughters of Heinrich Mann are on the ascendant. The pressures on American artists and writers to bend their work to a single political norm are greater today than they have been in a century. So are the material enticements to do precisely that. Critics, editors, publish publishing houses, galleries, compete to establish their political bona fides and demonstrate good moral hygiene, not to mention the universities. The very notion of giving prizes and awards based on artistic merits, merit is being replaced by a spoils system organized to benefit polit politically designated groups and factions. And the censors are everywhere. Strangely rereading reflections of a non-political man at this moment, uh, one sees uh, how much of it sounds like a commentary on the present. Just let me read you the following paragraph uh, written in 1917, 1918, about what Mann called cultural Jacobins. The outlawing and expulsion of those who disagree is completely consonant with the Jacobin's concept of freedom. Since he believes he possesses the truth, the blindingly clear truth, his love of truth is in a very bad way. He imagines himself justified, yes, even morally bound, to relegate to the deepest pit every way of thinking that cannot and does not want to recognize what glitters so absolutely for him to be light and truth. There is only yes and no, sheeps and goats. One is obliged to step up. Tolerance and delay would be a crime. The Jacobin believes he has to save his soul by not spending one more hour of even apparent companionship with apparent fools who do not see what he sees. Thomas Mann needed to learn the value of political democracy, which he did. We, in turn, have something to learn from him today, not only about the value of political democracy, but also about the threat that political passions, including democratic passions, can pose to the singular individual vision of each and every artist. Mann never abandoned the conviction that artistic freedom can serve as a check, quite literally a reality check, on the claims of politics. Art can remind us that not only is there more to life than production and consumption, it also reminds us that there is even more to life than is dreamed of in our moral values and democratic commitments. Nothing in life is everything. This is an irony that Thomas Mann, above all others, would have appreciated. Thank you.